So right out the gate, uh, if any of you are feeling, uh, um, maybe you're new, uh, maybe you're old, uh, maybe, um, maybe things are getting a little stale and you're trying to make up for it, all those things. You know, sometimes uh, one of the, the reasons we gather as the body is to stir each other up by reminder. And sometimes the enemy can get in and say, you don't need to hear anything you've already heard. Let me tell you this, the only thing new in theology is heresy. So let's go back and actually get a, a, a fitting word in its proper time. Like apples of, of, of silver and, and settings of gold. This is, this is the, the best thing that can happen, is we get the, the, the timely word of the Lord and get reminded of something that is so deeply true that it changes everything. This is how God has ordained it. And some of us can scorn God's ways. We'll get to that today. Um, and sometimes it can be, look, I, I need something new. I need something like, ooh, that was, that was different. That was new. And that mechanism is the same mechanism that, if entertained long enough, will grab onto something deceptive because it's new. And we don't need to be motivated by, by what can happen if we do something wrong. Let's get motivated by what God does when we do it his way. That's the better way to do it, right? So I'm much more chill today on purpose. I watched, I watched two months ago. I was like, dude, I was a preacher without a pulpit. I'm not going to spend so much time apologizing for that, but I will say this, that I know God used it. Hallelujah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So right out the gate, I want to suggest a book. I want to suggest a book to you guys. If you want to write this down, this is a very just fresh fire from the altar clarity for the daily walk in Christ. And um, I'm not going to suggest a book that was written in the last three years. Um, it's actually by A.W. Tozer. It's called That Incredible Christian. That Incredible Christian by A.W. Tozer. Buy it used on eBay. You can get it for like five bucks, a little paperback, you know. Get a beat up copy. Keep it in your pocket. Whatever you got to do. The good news is when you read that, you won't be getting text messages. It's amazing. All right. But I highly recommend that book. So I won't say any more about that. Find out why by buying it and reading it. That Incredible Christian by A.W. Tozer. All right. So, well, let's get into this. Read the Bible. Every book of the Bible has a special and important role in our lives. There is an important impartation waiting in the pages of each book that frees us and settles us and quickens us. Each book of the Bible is a medicine for a specific spiritual ailment. I'll give you some examples. I'm not going to go through all 66 books, but I'm going to give you a couple. The book of Romans is a study in the plan of God from ages past to reconcile humanity back to him. His role versus our role in this reconciliation and our ultimate purpose for life on earth. Romans is the gospel in focus. The book of Ephesians is a study in the wide-reaching benefits and blessings and responsibilities associated with a Godward life. Ephesians reveals the sovereignty of God in focus. The book of James is a study in the life that proves one is living a Godward life. James is supernaturally revealed love and fortitude in focus. The book of the Song of Solomon is a study in the intimate pursuit of God after us, his beloved betrothed bride, the heavenly Zion, his church that you are a part of, and of his unfailing and unwavering love for us. The Song of Songs is God's eternal desire for us in focus. The book of Psalms is a study of strength and joy and the satisfaction and the freedom from the ways of the world, all inside of a Godward life. This is called devotion or, or faith. Psalms is a believer's trust in God in focus. And now we get to the book of Judges. 
The book of Judges is a study on the dangers of saying and doing whatever we decide while neglecting or even being opposed to a Godward life. Judges is man's wrath or impulsiveness in focus. So um, I'm going to read. Uh, so I'm going I'm to ask you guys to be really honest. Is that good? We want to come to church and be courageous, right? It's one thing to say, we're not doing church. You can do church and say you're not doing church. You can throw a lamp across the room and be all, dude, I'm not angry. <laughs> and so, uh, so I just want to say, like, just because we say we aren't going to play church doesn't mean we're still not playing church. Just because we say we're not a denomination doesn't mean that the non-denominational denomination isn't an actual denomination at this point. It's just this funny moment. We, words are interesting. And a lot of the times we can boil down our convictions into simply defining things. Do you hear that? Okay, good. Just want to make sure that, you know, it's me and you. It's me and you. Um, also, one more thing. Uh, maybe it's because I got saved in a very uh, Pentecostal time of the Rock of Roseville's existence. Um, but uh, I can just tell you right now, if there is anyone in here that is just like, look, I'm just chomping at the bit, dude. I want to, I want to yell an amen. You know, I want, to, I want to say, get it, Brian, or whatever. You guys, please, if there's anyone in here that's willing to do that, can you just do that as we speak? Can we do that? Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Okay, great. For the rest of this, if you hear anything that hits you, give me one of those. It'll help me. It'll help me know. It'll help me know what's going on, who's got my back, and then where we need to go. Because I got about four different places I could go, and there is no way I can go all four today. Is that good? All right, so I'm going to ask you to be honest. I'm not going to ask who has read with the church. I'm going to ask who has not read with the church. It's not a condemning statement. I want to know. I want to know because I'm going to read through it, and I want to know who I'm reading to. But if not a single hand goes up, then I'm like, man, you guys are in, right? And if every hand goes up, I'm like, okay, great. Then what I'm preaching today is going to have a little bit more of an effect. <laughs> so can you raise your hand if you have not read through the story of Jephthah in the last week? It's okay. Put your, paint the ceiling with that hand. Awesome. Good, 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 good. I mean, awesome, and let's get on that reading schedule. Okay, amen. I'm going to read through what I call the tragedy of Jephthah. Now, um, I'm going to start in in Judges 11, 29, but I'm going to give a little backstory a little bit. Jephthah was a Gileadite. Now, there's some things to understand about the families of Israel. And uh, Gilead, he had sons. Jephthah was one of them. Jephthah's mother, however, was a prostitute. And so Gilead was not only a father that slept with prostitutes, and then in turn raised sons who would also have their priorities out of whack. Um, he had then had a bunch of sons with his actual wife. Those sons, as they grew up, they drove Jephthah out. Now, those sons would then be the elders of Gilead. This is how eldership worked in family. You have the father, and then whoever's underneath, the sons are the elders. Now, later on, everything goes all bad. I got to just paraphrase the Bible here. Israel went dumb, and God said, all right, I'm pulling back here. <laughs> I'm pulling back. There was a moment in Judges right before this that Israel actually says, Lord, deliver us. And the Lord said, I have delivered you guys so many times. This is the King Brian version. I have delivered you guys so many times that how about this? Why don't you depend on the gods of the people that you're serving now to deliver you? That's pretty intense, right? <laughs> Come on, Leah. And so um, Leah's like, get him. Okay, so he's like, he's like look, see if, see if Ekron and, and all these nasty like demons that the, that the peoples that I told you to drive out and you didn't, and then you decided to forsake me and now serving everything in the world. Why don't you see how that's going to work out for you? <laughs> that's intense. And then Israel goes, do whatever seems right to you, but deliver us this day. And it says that they repented, but God already says, even if you repent, I'm not, I'm not rolling right now like that, because I know your hearts. You're just, you just want a temporary deliverance, but you still value those over me. All right. So then, it, then this sentence, it's so amazing. It says that God's heart was grieved because of their suffering. 
Any parents in the room? Right? It's like, man, you're like, I know you think. Okay, who said this? I think it was, I don't remember who said it, but it's a great quote. Every generation on earth thinks that the one that came before it, that they're smarter than them, and the generation that comes after them, they're wiser than them. Every generation. Since the beginning of whatever, you know? It's funny. And so you're, you're trapped in that place where you're a little kid and, or you're a teenager or you're in your 20s and, like, the old are telling you stuff. And you're all, whatever, man, you don't get it, you know? And then all of a sudden you're that age and you're all, oh, no. They're going to hear it the same way I heard it. <laughs> what do we do? You know, it's like these moments, you know? There must be a youth pastor out here somewhere. Anyway, um, <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> So now we come to this point where I think it's the Amorites. I want to like call out Ken. Ken, is that true? Um, I, I think it's the Amorites. The Amorites are just, just pressing hard. And um, they're like, look, we're going we're gonna to make it real difficult, difficult for Israel. And then all the other nations, coincidence, all the nations whose gods Israel is serving are trying to destroy Israel. Every idol robs you of the very thing it promises. Every single time, no matter what. You think a fence is going to work for you? It won't. It will rob you of the very thing you think you're protecting with a fence. You think victimization is going to work for you? It's going to rob you of the very safety it promises. And I could keep going. I mean, whatever God told you not to do, you, you pick that up. It's going to rob you of the very thing it's promising you. It's interesting. And most of the time, when you have that idol, you will resent and mistrust anyone who tries to challenge it. Watch out. Watch out. All right, here we go. The, the tragedy of Jephthah. So now what happens is the elders of Gilead contact Jephthah. Where has Jephthah been this whole time? It says that he actually went into this other land, and, and people of worthless fellows is what it said. People that were just not in for the Lord at all. They were just trying to get theirs. And they all gathered around Jephthah. But it says, Jephthah was a mighty man of war. Don't fight Jephthah. And the elders of Gilead, that was Jephthah's brothers, came to him and said, Jephthah, um, I'm going to paraphrase here. Dude, you can seriously, like, kick A. And I was wondering if you could show up and you could then kick the Amorites um, and you could, we could get them out of here because this isn't working. And Jephthah goes, dude, why are, you, why are you asking my help? Like when I needed your help, you removed me from the family and made me go live out with all these people. What are you, what are you doing? And then they're just like, yeah, but you're good at fighting. <laughs> now, can you see already the roots of offense, the roots of bitterness, all those things? Can you see that? I don't have time to, to compare Jephthah with David, but if you would ever do that study, think about all the things that Jephthah would be tempted with and all the things David would be tempted with, almost identical, and how David versus Jephthah. It's interesting. But David did have the word of the Lord. It's a potent moment. He was anointed. It's, it's an interesting thing, that God already had his sights on David. Whereas Jephthah is just a bunch of human reasoning. And this is what we get with human reasoning. Then the spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah. And oh, I'm sorry. Jephthah did say to his brothers, all right, fine. I'll do all that. I'll beat all of them. I don't care. You know I can but at the end, I get to rule over all of you. That's the trade. Mm. Here we are. Judges eleven twenty nine. 29. Then the spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah. And I'm going to read for a while, you guys. So if you've got a Bible, open it up. Let's hear some pages turning instead of clicking. Did you know that an actual paper Bible won't send you messages from your, from your social media accounts? Did you know that? Did you know that if you read a paper Bible, you can actually just do one thing? <laughs> Do you know that if you read your paper Bible, you're actually choosing at that moment to lay down what is actually causing the very anxiety whose solutions elude you? 
I could keep going there, but I will not because y'all know exactly what I'm saying. Get a paper Bible. Bring it to church. I promise you that your leaders would be like, yes. You know, I remember back in the day, everybody would pull out their Bibles because everybody just had like brick phones and stuff. Like the Motorola Razor was like. <laughs> it's like, you could play Snake. Um, and I remember, I remember like, because you couldn't, you couldn't open up your Bible on your phone. So guess what you did? You had to bring your actual Bible. And so what happened is, is someone like me would say, hey, let's turn to. And then it would sound like water all across the room as everybody's opened up their pages and turning them. And it, it was like the sound of water. So interesting. And it would happen all the time. And so it was almost like this reset. You'd hear that. Raise your hand if you remember that. Like this reset sound, right? It's a reset. You're like, dude, we're about to get in the Word again. You know what's funny is the only time I hear that now is the very beginning of a Marvel movie. <laughs> that's, the only, that's the only time you can hear that now. It's like, what happened? Lord, bring that sound back into the church. Amen. All right. All right. Judges eleven twenty nine. I promise I'm going to get to my message now. Then the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah. God's still faithful. And he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed on to Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he passed on to the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. This is very important. And you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's. And I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them. And the Lord gave them into his hand. And he struck them from a roar to the neighborhood of Mineth. And basically he just whomped. Then Jephthah came to the home of Edmizpah. And behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter, and as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble to me, for I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. And she said to him, My father, you have opened your mouth to the Lord. Do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth. Now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemies, on the Ammonites. So she said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Leave me alone. Two months, that I may go up and down on the mountains and weep for my virginity, I and my companions. So he said, go. Then he sent her away for two months, and she departed, and she and her companions, and wept for her virginity on the mountains. And at the end of two months, she returned to her father, who did to her according to his vow that he had made. She had never known a man, and it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went year by year to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite four days in the year. Thank you, Sean, for handing me that scripture to preach this Sunday. <laughs> okay, we're going to be talking about the Godward life today. Put simply, the Godward life is a life taken up by, directed toward, and consumed by God. It is a purposeful agreement with the commands of God to worship him, to praise him, obey him, and glorify him. Where these things exist, the church is here. Missions exist because these things do not. The Godward life is the clear and straight road leading to all the high and glorious promises and provisions of God. It is a life of prayer, a life of study, a life of repentance, a life of humility and suffering, a life of worship, a life of mercy a life of inevitable glory. The Godward life is valued and enjoyed most by those who are already participating in it. And it is scrutinized and resisted the most by those who are already resisting it. 
The tempo of the Godward life is quick in spirit. In a Godward life, the tempo of our spirit is quickened. We are quick to seek God, quick to converse with him, quick to explore ways of delighting in his dealing with us, and quick to demand of our squirmy souls that he does, in fact, bear long with us and actually enjoy us. But in the Godward life, our soulish tendencies of our carnal nature are restrained. Our soul is slowed down. Things like anxiety, boredom, rash vows, being quickly provoked or easily angered, and a slew of other things that ensure more pain and chaos for ourselves and those we love, they're all out of place. And even a curiosity to a Godward Christian, because they are chaos. God is not the author of chaos, but of peace. You know, every once in a while, please stop using that scripture to help somebody who just doesn't know something. You know, in, in modern English, I'm confused means I don't know something. So you guys, I'm just really confused. Well, God's not the author of confusion. Hold on. Stop using that scripture out of context. What they're saying is, I don't know something. I promise you God is the author of not knowing stuff. He is. It is the glory. I'll give you a scripture. It is the glory of God to hide a matter. It is the glory of kings to seek it out. He doesn't hide it from you. He hides it for you. And sometimes you have someone who is living the impulsive life, which we'll get to in a second, and they're just tripping. They're just like, ah, I'm confused. I don't know what's going on. And they're just moving so quick inside, which is where wrath comes from. We'll get to that in a second. And they come to somebody, they sense that, they're, that, that the soul is slow and the spirit is quick and they want counsel. And they're like, I'm confused. And then we tell them it's not the Lord. Just because we can figure out a scripture real fast that has the word confusion in it. The actual word should be translated Chaos. Chaos. Confusion. It's an interesting, but uh, it's actually chaos. It's when everything is too close together. Everything is too mixed up. You know, the word con actually means with. It's not a negative. It's actually a lawyer term, pros and cons. It's actually underneath. There's actually a lawyer term that we've turned the word con into a negative, but con actually means to be with. It's interesting. Okay, so, uh, so the, the, it should not be um, how we determine the word confusion to be. It actually means chaos. It means everything too close together, too mixed up to actually slow down and look at it. So God is not the author of chaos. All right. Now we are the wrathful life. You know the scripture, uh, James 1.20, it says, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You guys ever heard of that one? Yeah. I mean, right out the gate, it should be like, hey, wrath isn't a good idea. <laughs> you guys, I, I got to be honest. I, I'm very suspect of someone that is just like, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a person of prayer. You know, like I'm, I'm in, or like, man, I'm, you know, I, I preach the gospel, or like, man, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm discipling people, I'm counseling, and yet they won't forgive. I'm very like, I think you might be more in personal momentum right there, and what things look like. You might be too proud of yourself, because God says very sober-minded things that do not fit in with neo. Theology, the new theology. He actually says, if you don't forgive, God doesn't forgive you. And all of a sudden we're like, is that the, the, the unforgivable sin? No, that's not, that's not the point of the scripture at all. He actually, used, he actually used an analogy. Jesus actually said there was a man who was serving under a king and he owed him a ridiculous amount of money. Like, no way anyone could possibly pay it back. And then the king is like, out with him. And then he pleads with the king, oh my gosh, please don't ruin my life. And the king has mercy. This is, uh, this is about God and us. And then, um, and then he, he forgives the debt. And then that servant goes out, 
Now this is us being forgiven of, of, of God and now going out and holding things against other people that they've actually done to us. And he goes to another one that owes him hardly anything. It's like a, like a, like a week's wage. And it says he grabs his throat and he begins to yell at him, pay me what you owe. And then the master sees it and goes, you wicked servant. I just forgave you all of that and now you're doing this to him? The, the implication is, why wasn't I duplicated in you? That's the definition of a born-again nature. It doesn't mean that if I make a mistake that there's no way out. It means that I'm supposed to make it right with that person the minute I know. But the new theology says, I'm forgiven for everything. I can literally, like, God gave me grace so I could live against him my whole life to paraphrase the new theology of today. No, it should, you should mourn the minute you see it. And of course you wait until you see it. But once you see it, you mourn it and you turn. This is why the Godward life is one of repentance. You guys, like there's so many people that have a visible expression of Christianity, but they're denying the power thereof that has been wrought in the inner man. And Jesus said to judge a tree by its fruits. All right, we're coming back. All right, here we go. <laughs> Ooh, that wasn't in my notes, by the way. Okay, um, the wrathful life. You know the word wrathful and impulsiveness are the same root word? Did you know that? It's the same word. Half the translations say the impulsiveness of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And the other translations say the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You know, the older languages were more about what is the meaning underneath things, Right? Um, even the word mammon comes from, it, it's, a, it's a complicated but simple word. It means the desire for mother's milk. And it denotes how a baby desires mother's milk. The word mammon, actually, the root is getting whatever you want whenever you decide you get it. it makes a lot more sense when Jesus says you cannot serve God and mammon. You either hate the one or love the other. Or you will despise the one and serve the other. It's not just the money in your bank account. A whole weird theology has been around for a very long time that the more poor you are, the more, well, the more righteous you are. That's not true at all. Quinky dink, those poor ask the rich that they think aren't serving God for money when they're not doing well. Just want to say that. Okay, keep going, keep going, Brian, keep going. Okay, we'll move on from there. Impulsiveness is doing things my way. It's fast. It's sped up. It is wrath in its pure expression. The tempo of a wrathful, impulsive life is slow in spirit and quick in soul. Are you guys with me on this? Yeah? Anybody else? Okay, good. I just want to make sure you're with me because we're about to go deeper. In a wrathful life, the tempo of our spirit man is sluggish and limping. Seeking God in this state becomes a drudging chore, something to procrastinate, even something to oppose. Here we avoid conversing with him and live like God does not even exist. In this state, we must remember whatever real encounters we have had with God in the past that would sober us up to now seek him again. We need to return to the ancient paths. And this is all but impossible with our souls whizzing past whatever thoughts and unctions our spirit man may suggest. The impulsive, wrathful heart, I, I know for a fact this is prophetic for some in the room. And I've, I've gotten more than an occasional word in the last week that there's going to be deliverance in this room, don't add what you've been trained on what deliverance is to what I just said. There is no permission in this room for the enemy, the invisible enemy, to make a mockery of and embarrass any child of God in this room. And if you will agree with what I just said, it can't borrow your authority to do it. Good. Amen. Because we're going to touch something here. 
and you're going to feel, some of you are going to feel a resistance to this, and you let it go, and it's just gone. No weird show, no weird thing. It's just gone. Is that good? Yeah. Awesome. We could deal with that, but we're not going to have to. Amen. The impulsive, wrathful heart cannot afford to slow down. In fact, a wrathful, impulsive, internal tempo purposefully stays so fast so that it will avoid being dealt with by its conscience and by God himself. The impulsive soul does its best to remain at odds with God. It has been deceived to believe that this is its safest place. Is it any wonder that the impulsiveness of man does not produce the righteousness of God? God is our only refuge, and he is our greatest joy. How easily we forget. We desperately, desperately need our intermediating shepherd. Boldly approach the throne of grace. Christ died to bring us to God. He made every provision for us to live the Godward life. To him be all the glory and the honor and the power and the worship. May the lamb who was slain receive the reward of his suffering. Say, that's me. You're the reward of his suffering. Say it again. Say, that's me. Come on. A man found a pearl of great price in a field and then sold everything he had to possess it. Jesus was that man, and you are the pearl of great price. For the joy set before him, you, he endured the cross. The reason we exist is to live a Godward life. Whatever satisfaction or happiness or being understood or peace or safety we can ever desire or hope for will be found in their greatest expressions inside a Godward life. Can I get an amen? amen. And the grandest opportunities and the most amount of options available to us are, all, are also God's heart and will for us. And so we experience these things in a Godward life. Now let's go back to someone who was not living a Godward life. Jephthah was quick to make a vow before the Lord. Numbers 32 says this though. 30 verse 2. This is before Jephthah. It says this. This is one of the laws. If a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind him by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. But here's another one. Jeremiah 7, verse 31. And they have built the high places of Topheth, which is in the valley of the sons of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my mind ever. Jephthah was a wrathful and impulsive man. As we will see, his neglecting to counsel the Lord would cost him and those he loved dearly to get counsel from the Lord. I used an older form of, okay. Jephthah had his own quickly arrived at interpretation of what was coming out of his door to be sacrificed. You guys, three things came out of his door he could sacrifice to the Lord according to the law of Moses. Dancing, praise, and his daughter. The law of Moses identifies both dancing and praise as acceptable sacrifices to the Lord. 
And he immediately chose his daughter. He trapped himself between two wrongs in his impulsiveness. Break his promise to the Lord or kill his daughter with fire. None of this was God's idea. In Jephthah's impulsiveness, he created a choice God never intended him to make. Don't we all find ourselves doing this sometimes? You guys, every villain in history thought that the worst thing they did was their only option. I will say that again. Don't think about the villain in history. Think about yourselves, okay? <laughs> every villain in history thought that the wrong they did was their only option. And what came before that was a whole slew of other deceptions they had to believe first. I'm not going to get into the wiles of victimization, but I can just say there has never been one villain in the history of Earth that didn't start out as a victim. There's never been one. I don't care how cliche you, you don't want your science fiction movies to be anymore. You want a more complicated villain. In the real world, every villain starts out as a victim. This is how this works. And victims think that their desperate decisions are their only option. Imagine being kicked out of your house and told you have no inheritance and sent to live in a horrible land with a bunch of worthless fellows and then everybody comes back to you when they finally don't have any other options. Man, I would say there's probably a good, a good amount of victimization in there. I don't know what to do. I'm trapped. I can't break my word to the Lord. I've got to burn my daughter with fire? No. There's other ways out here. You know, um, especially when we become uh, ill-adjusted, I would say rebellious, um, to the commands of God, we scandalize the commands of God. We make them unbearable. How many, you guys, how many times have we said this as Christians? Brother, don't pray for patience, man, because then God's going to bring things that test your patience. You, know, says, you guys, forgiveness is so hard. No, it's not. That's scandalizing the commands of God. You know what makes patience hard? Your impatience. <laughs> Can we just say that? You know what makes forgiving so hard? Our demands for wrath. Forgiving is easy. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. No, but you don't know me, man. No, I know you. You're a human. It's, it's, I mean, you're unique, but not that unique, okay? We're just, okay, like the gospel actually applies to you too. All right, thank you. Can I get an amen for that? Man, all right, all right, all right. But if we will respond according to God's eternal purposes and plans, even in our impulsiveness, he provides a way to glorify him afterward. You can take what I'm, this next sentence to the bank. There is always a way to glorify God. When we neglect the Godward life, we commonly vow things to the Lord, being led by our natural understanding and then put the blame on God for the trouble that ensues. You guys, I know y'all, you're like, you're like zealous. This is a rock of Roseville, right? You're just like, you're like, like get him. You know, you're just in. So, so I'll put my hand up too. Raise your hand if this has happened to you. You found yourself so enamored with God that you start telling him stuff. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And then it doesn't work out. And you think God didn't fulfill his word. Anybody? Anybody? Only four? Come on, you guys. Hi, 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 hi. Let everybody look around. Look around. Look around at everybody else. Look around. Look around. Okay. A third of you. Okay. My hand was up. It's all right. All right. Guys, I had a friend. I mean, I have a friend, but had meaning in this moment in the conversation a couple years ago. And he was bummed because he really wanted to see physical healing, like supernatural by his hand. How many of you guys would love to see that? Your own hand. Healing people? All right. <laughs> the third that didn't raise their hand, they all, happens every day, brother. Um, <laughs> um, amen. Get a YouTube channel. Okay, so, um, so, so here we are. 
And um, we're driving up. We're driving up. We're going to pick up something really heavy. I'm not going to get into it. But he was, he was right there for me. He was helping me out. It was awesome. And we're going to drive it up into the woods. And um, as we're talking, he's like, man, can I get your counsel on something? I'm like, if I got it, let's do it. And this is what he said. Because, you know, a couple of years back, like I'm, I'm having a really hard time believing for supernatural healing. Because a couple of years back, I remember I, I watched this thing on healing and I was so, I was like, God, I'm not going to pass one sick person without praying for them. If I see any injury, I'm not going to pass without praying for them. And he said, it's been two years. I'm exhausted. I haven't seen one healing. He's like, I get tempted to think that God is not fulfilling his word. And then I asked him this question. And we're, I mean, I'm not just like off the, you know, I'm, I'm thinking. I'm like, okay, God, what do you want me to say? Because this is obviously on your heart because you love him so much. So what would you tell him? You love him more than I do, and I love him. So, uh, and so this is, I believe, what God had me ask him. Um, let's back that up. You said that you told God, but then later you flipped it and said God told you. So let's go all the way back. Did God tell you to never pass up a single sick or injured person? And all of a sudden, <laughs> he's driving, he did this. He goes, oh my gosh. Like there was this, this, like, this like light bulb and he's like, what the? And I was like, hey man, let's, let's just erase that one because you're under the blood. And instead why, instead, why don't we actually just ask God what he wants to do? Say, God, what do you want to do? And he's like, man, Dude, the next time I see somebody, I'm just going to ask him. I'm not going to ride that one thing I said. I was like, well, I didn't tell you this, but I have a massive migraine headache right now. <laughs> and we're about to do some labor. And so what I was wondering, if you could just slow down and ask the Lord what he wants to do in this moment. Now, you guys, God already told me that morning he would heal me. So this is like a setup. I already knew that, but I didn't tell him that. And so, so he's, he's like, um, okay, okay. And he goes, I think he's telling me to pray for you. I'm like, amen. From this new place, right? He's like, yeah. I was like, all right. He put his hand on me. You guys, the power of God. I'm driving on the 80. Like I'm dri driving in the mountains and the power of God hits. And it was like, because you know, sometimes pain just goes away, but it's like he kind of wanted to show off a little bit. You know what I mean? And all of a sudden it's just like, boom. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. You guys, like, I, I don't have a headache. And um, he's like, seriously? Like this moment, you know, I was his first healing. And you guys, now this guy, he regularly, when it, when it occurs to him, when it occurs to him to remember to ask, he's like, he's way up in the percentages as far as seeing supernatural healing. Yeah. But it had nothing to do with his vow to the Lord and his impulsiveness. Now he's with God again. Now his soul is slowed down and his spirit is quickened. You guys, the flesh hates to be led. It loves impulsiveness and wrath. Impulsiveness is the very essence of how the mind set on the flesh operates. Okay, I'm about to, all right. Um, how much time? I mean, I don't know what time we usually end. I'm, <laughs> he's a 3 p.m., brother, 3 p.m. <laughs> all right, here's my next point. To obey is better than sacrifice. Today's milk toast emotionally, here, I'm just going to just, Prepare you, okay? Just put on your seatbelt. Okay. Today's milk toast, emotionally led Christians spend so much time securing for themselves things like safety, resources, fame, approval, and the appearances of a Godward devoted life, but will neglect and even resist the Godward interior life. They will resist and scandalize any discipling that pushes them towards self-control, patience, forgiveness, reconciliation, believing the best about someone who they are offended at, or blessing and praying for those who have mistreated them. You guys, Jesus told us to judge. Did you know that? He says, make a right judgment. He, he said in another place, do not judge lest you be judged according to what you judge. And then he used the example, do you tell people not to steal and then you yourself steal? He said, be very clear on what you're judging. But you guys, I, I mean, I hope that everybody in this room could say, hey, murder's wrong. 
I, I hope. <laughs> Little red dot, like just on the. Um, okay. <clears throat> My wife is like, don't say that again. Um, all right. You guys, Jesus told us to judge. Specifically, he told us to determine whether or not we or someone else is walking with God by the long-term fruit in our life. And you guys, I don't mean church growth. That's not what I'm talking about. It's like, that church is is, is having so much fruit. 700 kids in a room isn't what Jesus was talking about. It's just not what we're talking about. Dude, they got like a $4 million shortfall or, oh my gosh, they did the most amazing barbecue. You guys, I'm all about barbecue. Do it. Ain't nothing wrong with that. It's awesome. It's like the, like the sixth fruit of the spirit or the ninth or whatever in, in America. It's like we, we know how to do barbecue, you know? Some of y'all need to like step it up though. You know what I mean? It's like if I eat one more hot dog and a bag of chips, it's like, you guys, let's just, I love Costco, but you know, whatever. Okay. Just to give me some brisket. All right. If someone has three best-selling albums singing about Jesus or on staff at a church, have 200,000 followers on social media, and do a podcast talking about mental health and loving yourself, none of these things are on Jesus' list to determine if someone is living a Godward life. Now, you guys, I want to say this, okay? For those of you that are like, ooh, can I be bitter right now? No, no, no. Any of these things are good in and of themselves. And to be sure, there are deeply devoted and born-again believers who walk out those specific things. But all of those things can be attained through a certain level of marketing and natural ability. Simply applied inside a church atmosphere without any inward work done by God in and through Jesus Christ. Don't be so swayed by somebody's clothes, music, whatever. What's underneath? This has always been the mark and measure of what we gravitate to as believers until the last like 150 years. Put simply, it is a whole lot easier to fake visible expressions in music and meetings than the more intangible things like the fruit of the Spirit. Now, I know I just can't go through that, that next one here. Um, all right. Mm. Man, I keep going down here. I'm going to say this. I'm going to go all the way to the bottom here. You can close your eyes for a second. You need to slow down. And if you're looking at me, I'm just going to call you out because it's awkward. There's still four of you looking at me. It's so weird. Hey, close your eyes. We're all doing this together, okay? This is not religion, right? This is not just legalistic. We're actually closing our eyes and pressing into a Godward life. You're not doing anyone's service looking at me, especially not yourself. We need to commune with God. Jephthah needed to commune with God. He needed a group of people like we have in this room today. His daughter was living the Godward life. She was willing to give her own physical existence to not endanger her father's conscience. Jephthah, just like us, needed to be challenged and pursued and loved and rebuked. May we fall in love with the Bible once again. May we return to our dusty and neglected prayer closets. May we be desperate to see the lost saved once again. May we declare in every part of ourselves that God himself is our desire and our greatest love. May we put down whatever hobbies, whatever social media, whatever dopamine hits we get from our phones, and may we arrive to church full of Him and His Spirit. May we begin to be strength and encouragement and spiritual breakthrough for everyone else in our life. May we be generous with our lives. 
Jephthah had an option. He could have laid down his own life in exchange for his daughters. And we'd be talking about him today as a Christ archetype. May we be generous with our lives as nothing of our eternal selves are running out. We live on food that never perishes, that the world knows not of. Nothing is running out if we have Christ. If we're eating Him, if we're eating of His flesh, He said that it is food that never perishes. Romans 8, the Spirit gives life to the mortal body, not gluten-free organic bread. It's the Spirit that gives life even to our mortal body. The Great Commission, you can eat deadly, you can drink deadly poisons and not be affected. That includes pesticides on an apple. We've taken the cues from the world to such a degree that we've allowed ourselves to become self-identified as weak and fragile and affected by the very things the Bible says should never affect us. May we return once again to the promises of God. May we be slow in soul and quick in spirit, properly aligned to our rightful, internal resting place as children of God. No impulsiveness, no rash decisions, no wrath, blameless and without offense, until the day of his coming, blessed and kept in the arms of the Lord. May we return to the Godward life. Let's pray with every head bowed. God, I want to return to you. I want you to have the things I've taken for myself. I trust in your grace and your mercy to cover and even obliterate whatever vows I've made to myself that were not of you. Just take them away. Just remove them. I no longer settle in the prison of my own rash decisions and impulsive nature. I know I'm new. In fact, if you could repeat after me, I know I'm new. Born again in you. Nothing of the old will hold me back. I trust you with everything that I am. And I lay down whatever you're asking me to lay down. And I trust it's more than I see already. (laughs) You're the lover of my soul. Jesus, take it all. I want to be more like you. Amen. 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 Um, So you know what the good news is about Jephthah's story? Is we can look at it. It's a tragedy. But it's there. And we're like, you know what? I don't want to make that decision. And it takes something like this to link it with what we do every day. Some of us. I just want to close with this. You guys, Gen Z, but even older, even younger, we are in a famine of reconciliation in the world today. Try in vain to think about one publicly celebrated reconciliation in the last two years. Try in vain. Even five years ago, I remember this. Every social media was covered with them. This dad had not seen his son for 30 years and he disowned him and his son showed up at the door and opened the door and they're crying and they're holding you're like, oh my God, that's amazing. Like there's so many stories like this, even nation with nation, people group with people group, constant reconciliation until today. Not see it. Guess who's supposed to be the oracles for reconciliation on the earth? The church. And yet the majority of believers I know, especially the ones that God really wants to use, 
Most of them are locked in isolation, wrapped up in offense, scandal, bitterness. I can't believe this one leader. I can't believe this one church. And that's just not what God's telling them. God's actually asking them to return. He's asking you to return to peace and forgiveness and joy. Why wouldn't you return to your source of greatest strength, the joy of the Lord? Wrath is the joy killer. It hates reconciliation. It hates it. You want to rob the church of strength? Rob it of its reconciling call. May we return to this. Every person in here, you have someone you could call. You have someone you could call right after this. I don't care if it's awkward. Every breakthrough you've ever remembered in your life was preceded with awkwardness. You can't... You can never have a breakthrough letting the world tell you you have to avoid all awkwardness. That's how you get out of breakthroughs. You avoid the minute the spirit starts moving because it's always awkward. Always. You want to press into awkwardness in the church. We don't have to have this all together. Weird how we can say we don't play church and yet we avoid awkwardness. Weird, huh? It's got to get exposed. Let's do this. All right, you guys. So call that person today. I want you to think about it. I want you to think about it right now. Who's that person? Especially if you try to push that away immediately. That's the one. I love Francis. He used to say this. Man, I'm I'm almost done, but this is so good. Okay. Francis used to say this. Look, if people like raided somebody's house, okay, and the minute they come in, they're we need to raid your house. And the the dude in the house is like, you look at whatever you want. Just don't look in this drawer right here. (laughs) Everybody that raided that house could care less about the whole house now. The only thing they want to look in is that drawer. But they have a warrant, so they can. And you guys, if you would truly say that you are Jesus's possession, then whatever that thing that just happened, we're all, okay, it's that person, but I don't want to look at it. You guys, you're waiting for a breakthrough and he keeps walking you to the breakthrough and then you escape it again. That's your breakthrough. The one place God wants you to deal with that you said, it's too hard. I don't have the emotional capacity. I can't do this. Is God telling you you don't have the emotional capacity? Or are you just wasting emotion in impulsive places? All right. Lord, I just bless the Rock of Roseville. I bless every single person here that there will be oracles for reconciliation in this region and beyond. That not one person would leave here entertaining wrath, impulsiveness, victimization, offense, or anything else that exalts itself above the knowledge of God in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Amen.